Hello and welcome to Home Life for Extraordinary Impact. My name is Matt Barrios. I'm a husband, dad, researcher, and writer focused on the intersection between home, personal growth, mental health. What are the things that we do at home in order to help us have an impactful life in the world? That's what I'm exploring through this podcast, which is a sub project of my larger business, Home Life Design Lab. I'll tell you more about that at the end of the episode. Today, I have the privilege of talking to yet another amazing guest and interviewing him about his life um, in Colorado, as well as his expertise as an architect. So I'm happy to have Lance Psycho here with us today. He is uh, currently connecting with me uh, over uh, you know, our, our podcasting recording thing. And um, I'm just grateful to have you here, Lance. Thank you for being part of it. Yeah, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So um, one of the questions I love to start off with people is just what are some of the, que- uh, the connections that you see between how you approach your life at home and your work? Uh, and I could definitely see there's probably some connections as an architect. Yeah. Uh, so the, the way we, I connect, well, actually, <laughs> I, think, I think there has to be a boundary that's set. And so uh, I would come at this, if I'm coming at this from purely an architectural, an architect standpoint, one one of the problems, uh, one of the so everything is a double edged sword, right? So when you go to when you go to college to be an architect, the positive on the double edged sword is that they uh, teach you how to just fall in love with your work. You fall in love with the process. You become completely immersed in the whole thing, such that then the negative side of the sword comes out, and that is you probably spend too much time in studio. There's a phrase that happens all the time in architecture studio and even in, in, in the professional practice, which is the all-nighter. A lot of people, you know, they're, they're sort of proud of the fact that they are pulling all-nighters and not getting any sleep and, you know, staying up for three days on end. And it's just not the way we're built. It's not the way we're designed. We, we absolutely mm-hmm. need that six to eight hours and a couple hours of, of solid REM sleep in order to function as high-functioning uh, professionals and individuals. So uh, that's that's actually I, I would be have my my answer is sort of a contrarian answer here, and I would say there needs to be a separation between the two. So uh, I, I think you need to have a hard out at the end of the day. Uh, for me, it is five or six p.m. Then I don't answer any more emails from clients. I don't answer any more texts. I don't answer any phone calls. Same thing goes for our staff. We don't interact with any of the staff after that. The only person who I might talk to just briefly would be my business partner, who is also my best friend. Um, and so, but, and then, then I start the day very early uh, at 5 a.m. and then go again till 5 p.m. So, you know, just the separation of work, I think, is 100% necessary. And the same thing goes for the weekends. I think you have to have your breaks in order to do that. So I know I'm talking more about lifestyle. If yeah. you're, I don't know if your question is about if it's also about design and if you're looking to try to have some kind of symbiosis between the two there. Yeah, you know, I think especially as an architect, you can definitely see the interaction between design of the space and so on and how it actually gives birth to a certain kind of lifestyle, right? Um, so what are some of the things that you do at home or even how you've set up your space that help enable a lifestyle that you're hoping to have at home? Okay, yeah. So the, the way I would answer that is in 2015, my wife and I, uh, with our four children, we bought a piece of land north of town on 1.2 acres. We're very blessed to have it. And we designed and built a custom house for the family we were going to blend together. We're, we're literally the Brady Bunch. So I am Mr. Brady because I'm the architect, and uh, we joined families just <laughs> like that. We had we had to do that custom house because every other house that we looked at wasn't it wasn't suitable for us from a living standpoint where each of the kids would have their space, their room. We had a we had a particular set of uh, spatial program that was just a little bit different than than your typical family because I, I still work from home a, a, a fair amount to the point where. I need to have my own space, and so does my wife. So, mm-hmm. you know, having two two offices w- was paramount to the whole thing. And then there's the trick of trying to blend the families all together and making sure, sure. that, like, my children had a separate wing, they had a separate wing. So, but, but the overall, so that was sort of the problem. But in with the solution, you know, the solution to the space problem and, and getting everybody sort of what they needed, that was one side of the coin. But the biggest thing that I tried to achieve as an architect in designing our house was that I wanted it to be a sequence to reflect the sequence that I thought was the most proper for a human being to live throughout the day. 
So I did some, there's some big things, I believe in, you know, the power of feng shui and positive energies in that kind of way and sort of how you face and orient a house and then, you know, thinking about how, how it should interact throughout the day. So our entrance, and we have this giant two-story, uh, two-and-a-half-story foyer that's all glass, so you can drive by our house, it's the glass house, you can see an open staircase, and at the bottom of that is a water pool. And so the idea was is that everything, you know, without the sun rising in the, in the east, we don't have life. It's just not possible, right? I mean, you ha- we have to have this energy and this source of energy. What's the other second? What's the, what's the second part of that? If you don't have water, you also can't have life, right? Like mm. you, you need those, you need these combinations of things, yeah. uh, just these basic elements to make it happen. So, so our entrance faces east with all that glass, and there's basically a straight line through the house of open space, through literal, through actual space, but then from like window to window. So the western half of our house then faces the mountains to the west. And sort of, and then that's where my master bedroom is, and where I go to sleep at night. So the idea is, I'm, I'm rising and heading toward the, towards the east to meet the sun fearlessly throughout the day. I, I can't hide from the, from the day. Like I have to just kind of grab it by the cojones mm-hmm. and take it. Mm-hmm. And then at night, the symbology of okay, we're we're going down just like the sun is setting and setting against the mountains. That there's that whole linear uh, space sequence that happens at our house for that when you get to the second floor you know you can see the you can actually see the flat irons from boulder from our house and then the ba- last mm. biggest thing is, is is that trying to be just uh, conscious about the environment and trying to have the least amount of impact that um w- the arch- good architecture does is mm. it's a passive solar house so the way cool. the, and we tested it out the first time it was the first winter there in 2016 it was uh, so we have a lot of south facing glass with very large overhangs there's some floors that cantilever over the top of the lower floors uh and then also some very large roof overhangs up to like three and four feet depending on the side and everything like that we minimized the amount of windows on the north there's only one window on the north we have sky tubes up in each of the bathrooms upstairs both both sets of kids bathrooms and my wife's bathrooms to maximize natural light so we're turning off the we're turning on the least amount of lights possible throughout the day mm-hmm. but the way we tested it in the winter was it worked perfectly out uh, so on a, in colorado we have 300 days of sunshine and on the front range here the you know the, the sun is very low in the winter so it's able to just shine through directly into the house in the winter and then we capture that heat that comes that that sort of free heat from the sun right it was zero degrees outside that day the first day we finally got this after a fresh snow a fully sunny sky and then it was 72 above and the furnace didn't kick on so the passive heating was working perfectly wow in the summer uh we 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 have a similar effect in the opposite so that's where the deep overhangs at front on on the floors and then the roof overhangs also they're protecting Mm -hmm. from that high sun that we don't want in the house and then we have coupled with the water pool if on the on the certain right days if we open up uh the front door and then the big glass sliding door on the west we'll get a nice breeze coming through from the east to the west and it'll Mm -hmm. it'll blow over that pool of water and passively cool the house if we then also open up the awnings in the, the lower floor sunroom and then above it to sort of passively cool the house throughout the day that Gosh, that sounds like a, a beautiful setup for a home to live in and to uh, bring your families together in. And it seems like it's meeting both the really custom functions that you require working from home, uh, blending your family, as well as it seems to flow so well with the elements and the environment all around as well. I, I'm sensing a bit of a theme of uh, just how important this connection to the natural world and kind of the way, uh, I don't know, the rising of and setting of the sun and so yeah. on is for you. Would you tell me more about like how that became an important piece for you to be that kind of uh, maybe connected to in the environment? Well, I think the father of who started that sort of level of organic thinking that was trying to be make the architecture symbiotic and one to one with the built with the natural environment was Frank Lloyd Wright. I don't think there's any 
American architect or even a foreign architect who doesn't know who Frank Lloyd Wright is or wasn't highly influenced by, you know, the sort of the grandfather of, of modernism as it is today. So, you know, you look at Falling Water, and that's exactly the concept behind Falling Water was he wanted mm-hmm. to unify this this waterfall with the house. So it's stemming from that sort of line of thinking of trying to unify this piece of architecture on site with the natural elements and embrace them uh, as much as you can, but then you also have to shoulder from them, like I talked about in the summer when, when you're sort of starting mm-hmm. to shade from that. The other thing we have, too, is beyond the house is we live in an arid, we live in a semi-arid climate in Colorado, and on the, on the high plains here, it's technically a desert because it gets less than, I think, 20 inches per year. There's some metric like that where it's like 18 or 20 inches per year, and then you get, you're t- technically classified as a desert. What that means is is the typical suburban house, and ours is sort of like the suburbs of the suburbs because we live on 1.2 acres, so it's not quite, and we're outside of the city. We have a bunch of open space around us. So we're not quite suburbs. We're like suburbs of suburbs. Uh-huh. Um, but why I'm using, I'm stating that is just to set up this concept of, you know, you drive through the suburbs, and one of the things that I think just everybody thinks of when they think of the suburbs is grass, Right, so you're gonna have all this yeah, fescue, yeah. K- Kentucky kind of grass that is like the word right there. Are we in Colorado or are we in Kentucky? So like that <laughs> grass <sure. laughs> that is natural to Kentucky mm-hmm. is natural to Kentucky and it thrives there because they get a lot more rain than us. So when you try to put those kind of species of plants outside of a house in an environment like this, you are using an excess amount of water because it's just not it's just not made for this mm-hmm. climate. Like it did mm-hmm. not derive itself it did not it didn't grow here naturally in that sort of way so we took an opposite approach to that because i wanted to be as sustainable as possible from the standpoint of just resource using resources right and back to the back to the water right without water there isn't life we we need water every single day every living organism needs it and so what we did is we xeriscaped around our house my wife designed this beautiful landscape that's mostly rock and native native grass uh, which we use so we do have a lawn in the back but it's buffalo grass and buffalo grass is awesome we actually don't water the lawn anymore whatsoever uh, you have to water it for the first two years uh, not as much as you would if you were planting like you know, your typical kentucky bluegrass or something like that uh, it, it ends up only using about a quarter inch of rain or moisture equivalent through the summer but it just stays beautifully green. I mean, it's natural. It's buffalo grass. It's literally what the wow. buffaloes used to eat yeah. on, on the Great Plains. And then all, and then the, the rest of the plants around um, the, the, the whole property that are mixed within our rock beds are uh, natural plants native to Colorado. So we have aspirins growing, which are drought tolerant. Everything's drought tolerant. We have a lot of yucca plants. We have um, a lot of uh, sage plants. Uh, raspberries do really well. And then the only thing that we typically water is our garden. So we have 10 raised beds. We try to grow as much as much food uh, on our property that we can. Um, so we have, you know, right now the peas are starting to come on strong and we've been eating lettuce for a while. We've got, a, we've got everything's planted. I'm all excited. I'm very excited about it. We've had a very wet spring here uh, for all that. And then to boot, we have three chickens. We used to have six, but actually we're sort of becoming empty nesters, my wife and I, because uh, uh-huh. our children are uh 18 19 uh 16 and 14 and two of them are off to college already so you know we don't need as many eggs but we try to live a i try to live as holistic a life i I wouldn't we're not even hippy dippy people i'm just conscious of the whole uh, of, of how we should just be careful with resources you know i'm not even a climate catastrophist or anything like that i just think it's foolish to be wasteful it's you're wasting money you're wasting Mm -hmm. resources I think it's the I think it's a morally and ethically sound thing to do mm. is to just be as uh, careful and conservative with resources as you can while still living a life of abundance. I love that, and I think uh, especially when there's a sustainability angle, and of course that seems like a a value that you are holding as an architect and designing mm-hmm. your space and your landscaping and every every part of it. It sounds like that's incredible, and also just to not be wasteful. I mean that, that's important to. Um, to do that, I think you're you're kind of getting at what I think are maybe the uh, the things that I love exploring with people about their homes is how does that home help express maybe principles of, that you live by, hopes that you aspire to, um, and, and so on. Like maybe those 
intangible things, right? Abstract things. Yeah. How does your home help you step into that? What do you see for you? Oh, I think it just keeps me connected to the natural cycles, the natural, the natural events that happen. Uh, we can't get away from the rain. We can't get away from the snow. It, from terms of like, you can just see it in here in our house. It, it's pretty incredible. That, that's probably the only one of the only bad things about the house is that it's such an open concept home. We really don't. We have like one little hallway, and that's it. And it's on the upper floor, and it's maybe about ten feet long. But it's it's not even. But then it's open on both sides to so like two atriums. You know that entry atrium, and then this two story dining uh, dining room that we have that's adjacent to the kitchen. So you can hear everything wow. in the house. It's 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 almost a little bit too much. I mean, we got to sleep with like a noise machine at the, this at this point to do it. I'm glad you're bringing up the abstract part of it. So while we live in this beautiful multi-million dollar home, that is a dream home for me. I'm 40 years old and every architect has the dream of designing, building, owning their own house. It's uh, very much, and it's still, you know, the American dream is steeped highly in that sort of idea of grit and determination and and making making a space and a place for yourself in, in, in this awesome country. But it's... So all all that said, you know the fact that I have this this awesome possession, it, you know it's award winning and all that good stuff is wow. Uh, I I actually appreciate the intangible and the and experiences more than I appreciate possessions because as somebody who believes in the afterlife and God, I don't I I know that all of this is temporary, like eternity is forever, and that's what happens afterwards, and. You know, the money isn't everything. Not having it is, you know, it's one of my favorite uh, quotes. Kanye West says that, and that's what sort of drives me as an entrepreneur. And that, while that's true, I still also recognize that, like, yeah, but the memories mean a lot. Like those experiences of one of my most happy, some of my most happiest moments throughout the whole year is like if I'm waking up in the morning to go hiking on a Saturday, all the way up to the Continental Divide. You know, if I'm going from like 9,000 feet to 12,000 feet, a 3,000 foot hike, five miles in, five to 10 miles in, um, maybe I just have a couple snacks with me at best. I have a, a bottle of water, my fishing rods and stuff like that. If I'm sitting there by the water in solitude at one of these alpine lakes and with sweaty, dirty, it kind of exhausted, that's actually the happiest time for me. It, and it's not because I'm even an introvert. I mean, I'm on this podcast, clearly an extrovert during the week. But that's sort of the yin and the yang of my life. Is like, and, you know, even the office building that I'm sitting in right now, where people can see behind me, like, we designed, built, and developed this. It's an award-winning piece of architecture. Like, it's one thing for architects to want to design, build, design and build their own home. It's quite another if they then also get to do their own office building, and that's what we're doing. So, like... Cool. I, I'm I'm very happy with with the accomplishments and what we've done here, but mm-hmm. but I know that even those sort of things it's kind of like when you get a new a new truck or a new car. Like, yes, there is some level of sustained happiness if you're driving something you love every single day, but there's definitely like right away a big peak. You know, there's a huge yeah. surge of dopamine and serotonin right away, and it's going to dissipate. And maybe like I'm saying, like it plateaus out or whatever. But the, the longest lasting ones are like those memories I, will, I replay about, you know, going on those really long hikes with my, with my children, um, stuff like that. Uh, those yeah. experiences, you know, my brother's coming out to uh, Colorado this summer with a very good college friend. I'm going to pick him up from the airport on Friday, and we're going to go immediately from the airport up to the mountains, hike up to the lake, camp for the night. We're going we're gonna to go to a different lake the next day, camp for the night. We're going to wake up super early head back to the airport drop them off like that's life that's freedom that's uh, that yeah. that's what i i just tried to really stay connected and now my brother has actually even got me into the practice of grounding i don't know if you've heard of it it's basically it, it there's many different versions of it right so the most obvious one is like take off your shoes and go walk around in the grass after work for a half hour get grounded get like touch mm. the grass if you're uh, if you're you're out and about like get rained on if you are up at a, a lake or a creek like go jump in uh mm. go gardening i'm a big gardener you know getting just touching and feeling the earth and really really being as mm. tactile and tangible as possible while still recognizing like i'm part of the laptop class i'm part of the class of people sure. 
that is digitized and digital. We're, we're, we're talking here right now, right? A perfect example, yeah. San Francisco to Longmont, Colorado. So, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I just try to keep it very holistic lifestyle-wise. Yeah, absolutely. I, everything that you're mentioning with, with the values and the kind of lifestyle and tangible pieces that are important to you, it seems to revolve a lot around uh, memories of moments in nature, of stillness and calm that you mm -hmm. find there, and also anticipation of mm -hmm. those moments in nature with your brother coming up and so on. And it, it's no surprise to me then that you would want to live in a space that is so connected to nature, um, connected to the rising and setting of the sun, uh, you know, water and the elements and so on. Um, and in that way, it almost sounds, seems to me, at least the connection I'm seeing, is your home ends up being this reminder of that deep value for nature that you you cherish and value. Is that true? Do you see that connection as well? Absolutely. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I really, uh, I just really appreciate the mornings. I mean, for me, one of the biggest things to try to make sure that I'm a very, I'm a very productive person, and I have to be because I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm not just an architect. I have an architecture company. I have a general contracting company. I'm a contractor as well. I'm a podcaster like yourself, Matt, a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder and soon to be wow. North Dakota State University. I have a, a nonprofit community garden that I run in the middle of town where I have a couple Gosh, plots you're there. you're a busy too. man, Lance. Oh, my goodness. And, and, a, yeah. and, a, and a professional fisherman. So I have to wake up super early <laughs> and yeah. go to bed super early. And so, like, that, like those golden hours for me, I, I've sort of coined this term, like, those are the golden hours of productivity. That's when you can get ahead of the rest of the world. That's where instead of you waking up at 730 or 8, you're already behind if you're if you're trying to do all the things I'm trying to doing, and you're one a person like me is like the the world's already pulling you. You 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 actually need to be pulling the earth and and the world hmm. from five to seven a.m. Interesting. So when I wake up at five like that, and I go to my office up on the second floor that faces east, like every day I'm saying hello to the sun. Every day I'm getting that good energy and that yeah. that feeling inside of me, and like I'm ahead of. Of the earth, so I, I really try to connect in that way. That's really cool. I love that idea of pulling the world toward you by keeping that routine, that rhythm around early rising. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds like a really valuable uh, mindset as well as practice for uh, staying very, very productive. And it sounds like you have to be very, very productive in your life in order to maintain, uh, keep all those balls uh, up yeah. in the air, right? Yep. That's so cool. Um, speaking of maybe routines uh, and so on, you know, the ways that you're going through time in your home, uh, what are some of those routines or habits that you value along with this early rising ritual? Well, the, the one I would add to the early rising ritual that I'll tell you about, I just want to make sure I emphasize that is like, I uh, probably five or six years ago, like right after we moved into the house, I, I made it a point to uh, make it so that I, I learned how to meditate. And, and what's so interesting about learning stuff like that is like, I th maybe it's just me, but maybe other people will resonate with this too, is we sort of have these preconceived notions before we learn things, right? Whatever we're going to learn about, we probably have a preconceived notion, then we learn about it, and then we're like, oh, that was completely the opposite, or, or it wasn't, or maybe maybe it lines up with the preconceived notion. My preconceived notion of what meditation was was we're just home, we're just sitting there, we're not even thinking about anything, and that is absolutely the opposite. They even teach you this during the meditation classes. I can't even remember what app I was using, one of the popular ones back in the day, but what they taught you was, it was like, no, no, you are actually, your mind like it's never going to be perfectly silent maybe if you become like a buddhist zen master but that's not that's not like me the typical american it's it's really about you're going to have the negative thoughts that come through and what you do is you are recognizing them and when you recognize them they go away and then they get shelved and put all the way to the bottom and they get put into a corner where they don't usually emerge for the rest of the day at least in my that's how it works for me so when I started, when I when I when I was starting to do that uh, prior to us moving in, I, one of the other things I would do is I, I would stretch, uh, because I, as a forty year old guy who really wants to stay as athletic and as possible, like I would love for my me to be able to keep up with my grandkids, and actually take them to some of these special places all the way up to the Continental Divide in Colorado. You know when they become age, is uh, so what I do is I, I I as soon as I get up, I put on a pot of coffee, and, and then I meditate and I stretch for the first 15 minutes of the day before I do anything. I don't look at social media. I don't jump into my tasks, anything like that. 
I really try to make sure that I that I get some blood flowing, that I get my mind flowing, and then after those 15 minutes of, of meditating, praying, and and stretching as as hard as I can, really want to stay limber and loose. Then I'll hit the computer and start you know slamming the coffee and doing all the super creative stuff in those first two golden hours in the morning. And that's usually where I spend most. That's where I try to focus the most creative energy that I can have in the day. Or even the critiquing stuff, like if I'm taking mm-hmm. a set of drawings from a, um, a, a staff member, an employee, and I'm having to redline them and correct them, it's yeah. a very high level of thinking. Like my mind is, I know my mind is going to be most fresh in the morning in, in order to do that. I would say that's my biggest routine. And the other one is, and I, I, hope, I hope this resonates with your audience, and that is, I, I say this to my employees all the time. I'm like, but, and, but I'm not preaching, I'm sort of preaching to the choir because they already get it, and that is, you, one of the things you're going to do almost every day is eat a meal. And one of those meals that is probably for sure you're going to eat with your spouse or your children or, or your loved ones most in your life is supper, is dinner, the after work sort of stuff. It's, uh, I don't know why more people don't just lean in and really learn, really lean into it and just learn to love cooking and preparing the food. It's it like, there is something meditative about it. There's something um, decompressing about the whole thing. Mm-hmm. It's an art. Uh, it's enjoyable. Even if you prepare a meal for 45 minutes and the children come down and they sh- shove it in their mouths as quickly as possible and leave without even saying thank you, like you're still nourishing people. And my children do that every once in a while too. You know, like they, I'm like, hey, how about thanks for supper? How about <laughs> can, you do, can you do the dishes next and stuff like that? Yeah. But really taking and making, carving out like an hour of sacred space for yourself mm-hmm. and your family, even if you're just a single person. I think it's just so important. There's something spiritual about sitting down and eating. How many people don't get to do that? You know, like, like mm-hmm. We're probably in the one, 1% of the 1% in the whole world if you have a macro view of the whole thing. Shouldn't mm-hmm. we? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we be grateful for the mm-hmm. uh, the ability to? I, I think that all the time, especially when I go to the grocery store. Like if I have a craving for something, and I'll be like, I'll go to the grocery store get the, get whatever I want, you know, not spending a ton of yeah. money, but just getting whatever items I want, and going, hmm. I, I think there's there's something to be said about being mindful about the fact that like I was able to go to Safeway five minutes away and go get whatever I want, and I should appreciate that and give thanks to God and give thanks. Um, you know, to my wife and, and myself and just acknowledge the situation of abundance that we live in for that. So that that would be the other big one is like, well, I don't really, we don't really miss a lot of family dinners. I take the family dinner pretty seriously. Wow. I, I mean, the the beauty of the family dinner is that it's like the space for connection, yeah. right? It is the space uh, for building relationships, nourishing, nurturing relationships that you are most invested in folks that you live with, uh, whether that's family in your case or roommates or whoever it might be, right? Um, what What's interesting to me is this added insight that you're bringing about the nature of food preparation being this semi, you know, spiritual, ritualistic grounding experience. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think that part isn't something that I hear people talk about as much. The fact that while you're spending 45 minutes and you've got your hands in greens and you've got and you've got your knife out and you're chopping uh, you know tomatoes what have you right like that is actually this very very mechanical simple thing that um i don't know it it actually like gives the mind a little bit of room to ro- roam for yeah. one thing i think and also it is so clearly this tangible like act of love and care and nurture for folks that you care about, so I love that you're, you're making that connection with uh, with uh, food prep because I don't think as many people are talking about that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's important, to, and I, I like that you brought up. Uh, that's a really good point about it. Uh, so it sort of frees up your mind a little bit. It reminds me of um, like some of the best ideas that I have, and I've gotten into a better habit of it. Like I, I go on these, I go on these crazy hikes. I go on these five to ten mile one way, five to ten mile back, same day sort of thing i'm out in That's the woods well, well. All, all all day a lot of times by myself uh it, it's usually on the um so in the summers i'll take off wednesdays and do this and then on uh, the weekends it's usually saturday and then sunday's reserved for family and church and all of that but w- what i've gotten in the habit of and, and why i'm trying to relate this to the food prep is like 
isn't it interesting when we're doing these physical things like how what does it do to our mind like all of a sudden our mind is sort of free it's like it's like you hear the cliche story about the you know i'm in the shower and i get that's when i get my best ideas right Mm -hmm. so some of my best ideas are basically when i'm hiking like that and i've gotten into i've tried to get into the habit of okay now i'm even though I don't have see, the other beautiful thing is I don't have service up where I hike, so like yeah, I'm completely great. disconnected. But I still have my notepad on my iP- on my iPhone, so I will use voice to text, write down ideas. I've even written a couple blogs recently doing it this way, wow. just kind of voice to text. But there's something about that physical motion, even if it's the most mundane stuff, like you're saying, like chopping onions. I don't know what the repetition does for us. Mm-hmm. But it really it, it connects something up on the brain, and somebody's probably screaming at their podcast, their earphones right now, going like, oh, "It's called this," <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, know, totally. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. The act of putting one foot in front of the other and chopping onions and what have you, like, it ends up just getting into this very rhythmic thing where it's like you're just entering into this dance. And I you know, mean, my wife, we love to dance, and um, and like, I just think it's this moment to. Find find rhythms, find harmony, find connection with maybe something be, beyond us. And it sounds like you are a very very spiritual person, and that's like an important part about what those things do. It kind of captures some intuition. Um, something speaks emerges from within you mm-hmm. in those times as well. Um, I'm curious, what does nurturing that um, kind of spiritual intuitive part of you at home look like? Oh, man, at home. Very interesting question. Uh, uh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I mean, it always, you know, the meditation stuff happens in the morning, mm-hmm. for sure. I think that's, that's pretty important. I guess the way I look at home is that it needs to, I feel like my day is chaos. And I am the person who is usually bringing order about the chaos. So, you know, I'll make a couple of analogies here. For example, if if I have a client and they have um, they bought a property up in the mountains, and it's a raw piece of land, technically it's chaos. Uh, technically it's mm-hmm. chaos because there's no order to it, right? There's no hard lines and dimensions and and space that is clean and safe created for humans. You know that that sort of thing. If I'm if I put on my builder's hat, it's construction is organized chaos. Like it truly is. I mean, it's it's men. Sweaty men, yelling, swearing, doing things, um, you know, banging sticks together to make a building like that. That's it's that's a crude way of putting it, but like it's it's the truth. I mean, mm. you're really man against nature when you're actually building. Oh. It, it's a hundred percent true, right? So I feel like when my day, when my day is like that all day, and then there's also like I, you know teaching at the university, so like organized chaos with 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 a bunch of uh, students, right? Uh, that that <laughs> sure. sort of way, like there's a lot of questions yeah. I got to deal with. That, then there's just all the and miscellaneous um, surprise problems that come up throughout your day, or whatever. For me, then what the house needs to be when you get there is it needs to be the opposite of that. It has to be order. So mm. you know, one of the innate things that is now I, I'm realizing why when I w- when I was a single dad, for instance, and raising my two biological kids on my own for a couple of years was like they're young and they got they're like messy kids and it was tough for me to come home from all the chaos to a house that was out of order Mm -hmm. you know now it's evolved to where like well now all the kids are pretty clean like they're basically little adults uh my wife does a great job about you know tidying up the house and and i do too i'm not a messy person or anything like that and we try to stay organized so I, i would say it's uh it's just Making sure that that house is our house is hopefully is quiet mm. and clean and orderly. It is not anally order orderly. Trust me, there's sure. dirty dishes and stuff here, but like not a lot of clutter. I just I just can't deal with that because that's my whole day is clutter. Mm. So I, it really has to be a place of sanctuary for me to just have my spirit feel at peace. Hmm. Yeah. The uh, the lack of visual clutter, untidiness, yeah. all of that it creates this sense of sanctuary. I, I, even that word uh, says so much about the, the value that you bring to um, you know, that, that level of tidiness and order in your home as setting a spiritual tone for, uh, for something, you know, for something to emerge in you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, now I wanna ask just, I know as much as we're talking about these intangible things about home, um, kind of the way that they 
interact with your personality and your values and stuff. I'm also interested in people's possessions. Um, so do you have any prized possessions um, that are like maybe things that you treasure, you care about, you use often that are parts of your home? Oh, just the space. I think the space itself oh. and how we carved it out is the prized possession. So everybody's got a budget. You know, uh, to put it in brass tax terms, we built our house for $680,000 in 2016. And now it appraises for, for over a million dollars. So, you know, let people who are listening to this throughout the country and the world, depending on their area, right? Let's say they're in um, rural Alabama. I am sure that price tag to somebody in rural Alabama sounds like wow a million dollar house that that's that must be either a lot of house or it must be a very like a house that is a palace of gold or something like that sure. and i'm not just i'm not just trying to pick on anybody i'm just saying like the, yeah, yeah. the rural real estate is 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 it's cheaper to build in a rural area typically that's just how it yeah. works hmm. uh, land is cheaper all of that kind of stuff but our house doesn't have any of these sort of you know we don't have gold plated toilets nothing like that we have like we have like mid-grade finishes in the house the richness of the house or how all the spaces intertwine together and how Hmm. open and spacious the house is and how we're always connected to even laying on the couch so on our living room we have this big u-shaped couch uh that can seat like 12 people if it really really needs to awesome when we're laying even on the couch if we just look up um, you know, laying there, we can always see the sky because we have these we have these clear story glass windows and everything like that, and you know they'll frame the clouds in a certain way depending on the day and that sort of thing. So you know, and then like that entryway again, that's you know two and a half stories of glass when we have a rainbow and we can see that from the inside of the house while it just after it just finishes raining or you feel connected in the way to the thunder and all of that sort of thing. So I think the fact that we just surrounded what was nothing before right on that piece of land and with the walls and the form and the roof and the windows and all the rest i think our prized possession is the space that we carved out that's beautiful and i mean i think very fitting for an architect to so so deeply value what you said as you you mentioned earlier like this is sort of the crowning achievement the the big goal for many architects is getting to build their own home, Mm -hmm. uh, design it themselves. So it makes a lot of sense that the space itself would be a truly prized possession. Um, As we're getting towards some wrapping up motions in this uh, episode, uh, I wanted to ask you if you have any suggestions or recommendations for people who are listening, perhaps especially from this natural architectural perspective on ways that they can uh, make their home that much more of a great place for them to live. Yeah, I think you have to write down a list. And the and the list would be things I hate about my house. And, and I'm serious about this. You you have to re, you have to really define what you what you hate about it and go through that exercise. If it's an existing house, if it's if it's a brand new house, y- you would still apply the same thing. And, and here's what I'm getting at is like let's say let's say you're living in the existing house and you write down the list of of things you hate about the existing house. But at the same time you're you're looking to buy a piece of land that list about what you hate about the existing house will help inform how you build and design the new house because you're going to avoid those things plus plus it's just good to get like negative energy out in a way that doesn't try to make it stick on to other people like like you Matt, or or, or my dog or whatever like just <laughs> sure. get just getting it out sort of in a um in an innocuous way on a piece of paper can can make a big big difference in your life the second thing I would do is like this is this is a, so I grew up in a house of I, I wouldn't say my mom and dad are hoarders, but they like knickknacks, and to me it clutters space and it is basically it's sort of like negative energy because it doesn't it's not clear space it's just not you you know it's not the kind of space that your mind can understand as easy as an empty room like you can understand an empty room very easily if you. If you walk into the opposite of that, where it's just clutter everywhere, floors, ceilings, walls, the whole thing, you're, you're like you're literally walking through kind of just stuff on the floor. That that's disorienting and difficult to do. I'm not saying you go all the way to the extreme of the white box, but somewhere in between. So I think less is more, and I've always liked to live by that mantra of less is more. Less possessions is more 
uh, freedom from the time you have to try to find space for all of those kinds of possessions. Uh, less, uh, less, less debt equals less, less worry, right? Um, mm-hmm. Any, any kind of and less drama means you know more positivity. So mm-hmm. I, I think if I think those are a couple things that there's like anybody who has an existing house should should be tackling is like how can I declutter? How can I clarify my space? And and the 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 biggest thing I think for any homeowner listening, if they are, if they really think that they're you know maybe they've made the list, maybe they've decluttered their house, maybe they've saved some money, and they're thinking about actually potentially hiring an, an architect, is uh, we have an episode called if you just Google it, it's called how to work with an architect, and it's and it's on YouTube, and basically I it's just me riffing for about forty five minutes. Basically, doing what the American Institute of Architects claims to do, and that's tell the general public what it's like to work with an architect, is I, I think, you know, a, a call to an architect for a potential uh, consultation, or even, or, or you know, and then maybe maybe they end up working with you, or maybe you guys don't, but just a simple call to them before you decide decide to actually do something to your house or your property, whether it's even just taking down one wall or if you're trying to take off the whole roof and add another story, or you bought a piece of land, will go so far just to try to understand the hurdles in the process you're going to be up against when it comes to the planning departments, the building departments, the zoning departments, how the construction cro- uh, process works. I think, I think the, a mistake to avoid is you, you really don't want to call a builder first. You actually want to call an architect first because the architect, mm-hmm. the architect has an even bigger perspective on the whole process than almost maybe anybody, um, because mm-hmm. usually they're the ones actually end up hiring everybody but the general contractor. You know, they're the ones actually even hiring the engineers to do the engineering work on your house or your building and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So don't be afraid to to try to call, just call that architect if the, usually most most people are willing to at least you know give five to ten minutes of their time, and that that could save you tens of thousands of dollars in the end um, by just by just having that initial call with them to you understand the process if you're actually trying to transform your space into better space those are excellent suggestions lance thank you so much so if any of you who are listening uh are now have this new spark of interest in hiring an architect to uh build your dream home i mean i hope that you uh, look up that episode that Lance recommended and uh, give it a listen. So, uh, Lance, as we're finishing up fully here, uh, what are the sort of things that you are working on right now and how could people get connected to you if they want to hear more? Oh, gosh, we're working on too many things, probably. <laughs> uh, I'll just, so we do, we have a staff of seven architects and then we also have a construction company, a staff of three over there. And architecture wise, we do, we're doing almost everything. We're doing small commercial work. We're doing uh, some really cool custom single family homes up in the mountains. And then we're doing, you know, multifamily stuff down in Denver, like 70, 80 to 100 townhome units sort of thing. Everything under the sun. We're, we're always doing cool stuff. If anybody wants to keep up with what we're doing, they can sign up for our newsletter. If you go to f9productions.com, a little pop up will come up. Sign up for our newsletter. You will keep up with everything we're doing architecture wise. And then if you want to listen to my voice, you can go to insidethefirmpodcast.com and you can subscribe on YouTube, on YouTube or iTunes or any of the terrestrial listening platforms. And I'm always welcome. I'm always happy to link in with anybody. They go to linkedin.com and they just search L-A-N-C-E, last name Psycho, C-A-Y-K-O. So that's Lance Psycho, C-A-Y-K-O. I will connect with you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Lance. I will take... Uh, you know, links to all those things that you recommended. I will put them in a blog in the show notes. It's the companion blog for this podcast episode. Just go check that out uh, if you are interested in uh, getting an easy way to connect to Lance. Uh, this has been another episode of Home Life for Extraordinary Impact. And, uh, you know, this is part of my larger project, Home Life Design Lab. In this uh, larger project, Home Life Design Lab, me and my wife are seeking to help 100 million people transform their quality of life at home. Part of that includes architecture, like in this conversation that we had, but other layers of it include our relationships, uh, our, the ways that we go about our routines, the ways that we arrange and design our space from an interior design perspective, and so on. Really, it's a very multifaceted project, and we are doing global research on it, interviewing people around the world to understand what home looks like for people in Guatemala, in Denmark, in so on and so forth. If this piques your interest, then go to homelifedesignlab.com 
so that you can sign up for the newsletter. And please subscribe and uh, rate this episode of this podcast so that we can continue to um, you know, serve you and uh, spread the word about this show. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And until next time. Thanks for listening to Home Life for Extraordinary Impact. I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed putting it together for you. Please take a moment to rate it, like it, and subscribe wherever you have listened or watched. If you really loved it, check the link in the show notes to become a premium subscriber to support the ongoing work of this project and to unlock some exclusive premium episodes. Home Life for Extraordinary Impact is a project of Home Life Design Lab. Find out more at homelifedesignlab.com where you can sign up for the newsletter and follow along on Instagram and TikTok. Thanks. Thanks.